Beef Market Update on RealerCulture.com with Ann Dunford is brought to you by FSC's Cattle Price Insurance Program. We're here today on RealerCulture.com for the Beef Market Update with Ann Dunford. Welcome today, Ann. Hi, Sean. And uh, there's a lot of stuff happening. Before we get to the domestic stuff, let's talk about issues that are happening globally. Uh, obviously, we've had a tragedy uh, in Japan. We've got uh, unrest in the Middle East and places like Libya. Does any of that have effect on the beef industry specifically? Well, it's frustrating because nothing's changed from a day-to-day -day basis in regards to the supply of cattle and we still have the same number of cows as we had yesterday or last week or a month ago and those kinds of things. But because the markets have become so globalized when you talk about commodities just in general, these outside influences, and we've talked about them for some time, you know, now we've got uh, two or newer stories that we're talking about with Japan and Libya, but as you recall over the last many months we've been talking about uh, how impactful these outside markets can be and when it comes to th impacts on oil prices yeah sure we get impacts here in North America in reaction to costs and then of course when you start talking about an economy like uh, Japan uh, being such a large economy absolutely very much uh, impactful on what the speculation in, 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 in regards to what exports might be remember that a lot of this build up in the beef price has been on strong exports in the last several months out of the US and so anything that kind of um, uh, might negatively impact that is going to impact price. Whether it follows through and is a long-term thing is up for debate and question, but it obviously has an impact right off the bat. It probably gets more speculators looking at the market and saying, oh, is there, you know, is there some money to be made here? Right. Or, and, and, and it might just be what happens in the short run versus the long run. So is there some uh, uh, change in regards to, you know, ports getting closed and, uh, you know, disruptions to shipments of products? Uh, from the U.S. or and vice versa, imports of products. So, uh, but longer term, like uh, the common saying you'll hear is, you know, people still are going to need to eat, and of course, areas that are still a long ways away from the devastation um, are really still, as we understand it, operating um, on a kind of a day-to-day -day basis as normal. Okay. Let's come back. We'll go to North America now. Uh, I was reading last week in uh, CME Group's uh, cattle report, they said that uh, cattle under 600 pounds is actually, the placements are 25% higher than a year ago, and cattle over 800 pounds are placed at about 11.8% lower percentage compared to last year. Why such dramatic movement in both directions? Well, and if you've been watching the U.S. cattle on feed reports over the last several months, it's been very interesting. First of all, the March 1 numbers for U.S. on feed up 5%. Well, who would have thought, after all we've talked about smaller supplies, shrinking cow herd in North America, that we'd be seeing more cattle on feed, but that has been the pattern this winter. So what's been going on? If you go back and look, we've had larger pace placement patterns really since last August. Of course, we ran into the winter wheat um, trouble pastures and so more cattle coming into the feed yard last year. And now we're into this situation where we've got these record live cattle prices going on. You've got uh, strong deferreds. We've been up into that 120 plus area for the fourth quarter of 2011 for quite some time. So big uh, demand and a big uh, kind of a signal out there, place cattle against this time frame. And so what you've got, in my opinion, what you've got happening is, first of all, last fall feedlots were busy placing all the heavyweight cattle they could. The signals were right. They're making money on those cattle. Then they go into the lightweight cattle, place those cattle. Now, in my opinion, really all that's left to place, if you want to put anything on feed, you've got to draw in the lightweight cattle. So under 600 pounds, up 25%. I'm going to go out, Sean, and say that going forward from here, all these placements are going to be down. Okay. Well, my theory here, it was that when I first read this, my first theory was, well, it makes sense that we're buying a lot more lighter cattle because the actual cost of, on a per unit basis is, is higher. And so because people's loans, uh, their loan amounts aren't, can't increase because banks aren't lending more money to the cattle industry, we've got to buy lighter animals to, to fill our, our, our corral. Is there any substance to that? Good. You bring up a really good point um, simply because there's no question as this market moves into record high prices, which we saw two weeks ago in the U.S., um, you do have this, what kind of credit does it take to continue to operate in this environment at these higher prices. And so that's absolutely a big factor as uh, feedlots look at financing today, tomorrow, and down the road. And uh, so I, I wouldn't discount that factor at all, but I'm going to say mine was the bigger. Okay, well, you're known as the expert, so we'll <laughs> go with yours. Uh, now coming to, uh, to Alberta or to Western Canada, um, a lot of talk in a lot of coffee shops right now regarding packer kills. Uh, where both Brooks and High River are, are down to four day a week. 
uh, kills, and I've heard that Calgary has slowed down as well because of the uh, lack of supply of cows to slaughter. So where do we go from here? Um, are we going to go back to five days, or is there any chance that we could actually see a three-day wheat kill? Well, after what we've seen this winter, I don't think anything, you can't say nothing is impossible, but uh, don't, don't forget a few things. First of all, seasonality. I mean, at this time of year, often is when we get kind of that so-called hole in between the last of the yearling cattle and the start of the calves. So this hole does look a little bigger. Remember our calf placements last year were very late coming. We didn't really get at placing big numbers of calves until we got into November in Western Canada last year. October placements were very small. So we placed them later. Hasn't been the greatest winter for feeding. So I think you're, you're kind of looking at a hole normally that's maybe just a little bit bigger this year as far as timing is concerned. And you're right, we talk about, we've talked about smaller cattle supplies, smaller numbers on feed. Um, the story that we're talking about as far as packing plants, you can take that right back. There's obviously feedlots that are running with less inventory or some with none. Um, so it's not just, this is all the way through the system. Can it go on? It does look like we've got some very small supplies for a few weeks in here. I do think, of course, remember our November and December placements were very aggressive. And so I do think that there's cattle supplies come summertime here in Western Canada. So I, will we ever get back to a five-day kill? Absolutely. But when? Uh, I do think we've got some tight weeks ahead, and I don't think we've seen our tightest supplies just yet. You think that we can get even tighter from here? Right. Doesn't mean I'm not suggesting necessarily a three-day week, but um, it most certainly uh, could mean that the draw to pull cattle forward, which is in price, is how the only way you're going to get that done. Is uh, going to intensify. Well, for the viewers that haven't connected the dots, a four day week kill is not a profitable week for a packing plant. No, in today's environment of running these very fast, efficient uh, plants, I mean, efficiency is all about uh, uh, keeping costs in line. So, running uh, a short kill is not um, conducive to being profitable from a packing plant. And let's just put some numbers around that. In the last three weeks, we haven't had a, a Canadian kill, a national kill, over 50,000 head. And um, in the last seven weeks, I think I made a note of kind of 48,000 to 55. What does that mean? Over the last couple of years, we would more run in that 55 to 63. Uh, back in 2008, getting up to around 66,000 head a week during this time frame that we're talking about. So this, you're looking at eight to 10,000 head shortage per week compared to the last couple of years. So it's pretty significant. And being at four days a week is not ideal the, the packer would like to be at the five to six because that's when they're making the money. This is not, uh, hopefully, hopefully this uh, comes to an end, but you're saying we're going to get tighter. I think we get tighter. Now on the flip side, I mean, he's got a shortage of getting supply in. Remember, we've talked about and we saw USDA announce uh, or release the numbers for February uh, retail prices. They were record high again this past February. So the other side of it is moving this product out the other door at higher prices too. So kind of a, a double-edged sword here. Okay. Uh, and finally, let's talk about what everybody wants to talk about, which is uh, trying to time the spring highs. Mm -hmm. um, so, in the U.S., April is our spring high. Uh, you told me earlier that in, in Canada, March is the spring high, but some things have been changing in that regard. Yeah, if you look at the good, the good old historical numbers for Alberta fat cattle prices, 20-year high would put it, put, put it in March. Even a 10-year high over the past 10 years uh, would put it in March. If you look at the last five years, we've seen a change though in where those highs are getting placed and they're getting pushed out later into that second quarter. And so if you just look at a five-year Alberta average, we are now into April. And the next thing you might find surprising or your, your um, viewers might find surprising is after, Mar after April, you'd think maybe March? No, May would be the next logical month in the last five years to place yeah. the high before March. When we're placing cattle in the fall, we don't usually think of, we've got to hit those May highs. No, no, it's a, traditionally it's been a time frame, but it just looks like our highs have been pushed a little uh, further forward. Uh, basis levels have been a factor. Our basis levels have gotten stronger in uh, that second quarter, and it's helped the Canadian price vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. price get stronger in relation to the U.S. So what do you think is going to be the case this year? Well, I'm, I'm going to stay with the U.S. Uh, that their high was two weeks ago. I, because we've then got Canadian basis and Canadian dollar to deal with, we're where you call the Canadian high, um, I'm going to reach out and suggest that we maybe haven't seen the Canadian high yet. We're going to go higher? Yeah. Basis tighter. Ba and mainly because of basis? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I say the U.S. high is in, but I'm not ready to write off the Canadian high just yet. 
Uh, it's it's uh, it's imminent. Uh, it's in that time frame we've talked about. But uh, uh, for for first half of year, lots of years we can make a December high higher than our spring high. in 2011 could easily be one of those years. Yeah. Okay. And it's shaping up to be a very interesting spring as usual. And uh, we'll talk to you again in two weeks. Super. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.